morning guys uh, this video will be centered on what we can possibly consider as a Buddhist communal ontology or what a Buddhist communal ontology would look like um, I'm gonna primarily be borrowing this from the Japanese philosopher Nishitani if you do know him, uh, you probably know him by his um, Religion and Nothingness, which is a sort of very pivotal work in his thinking. However, the, the sections that I will be borrowing from will actually be a part of Nishitani's um, later thought. Uh, in what is just called a book by him called Buddhism. It's just called Buddhism and by Nishitani. Um, but however, this is straight from the introduction, which is written by Robert E. Carter. But I thought Carter's introduction to N Nishitani's thought here gives a really good sort of foundational summary of what we can possibly consider, again, as a sort of Buddhist notion of a what, what a communal ontology would look like. So here I'm going to read towards the end of the introduction by Carter here, um, titled On a Grand Scale, and um, here it is. A significant part of the meaning of enlightenment is to genuinely come face to face with one's own self. It is important to keep in mind that Nishitani's understanding of self is a Buddhist one. We truly become ourselves when we empty our minds and allow the world to advance us. The ego cannot be our center focus if we are to advance to authenticity. Rather, we must discover our selfless no-mindedness. The self of non-selfhood is another centered. Rather than self or ego centered. The result is a subjectivity of no selfhood. Selflessness as a non-duality of self and other. It is an embracing, pure and simple. It is a no-mindedness that accepts others just as they are. In a true relationship, each of us reveals a place deep within ourselves, where the other can reside safely, that is, where there is trust and trustworthiness. In the Socratic sense, it is a coming to know oneself. Nishitani's rendering of the Buddhist sense of conscience is that of unrelenting conscientiousness. And as with Socrates, it is a conscientiousness of ignorance. When we peer deeply within ourselves, we must confess that we do not know what we claim to know or pretend that we know. When we scrupulously examine our knowledge, we find that the clearest knowledge is that we do not know at all. And this not knowing is an unending spur to further introspection, resulting in a sincerity that unceasingly finds itself in others and in their protection and nurture. Nishitani's self is a non-egoic self, and it is a self that knows itself only through extending and its boundaries to include other people. It extends even to the farthest edges of the universe. It is an expanding self, a self always already in community, and a self aware of its ancestry as a manifestation of divine creation. However, that is to be understood. Nishitani's suggestion is that if we look within ourselves, we will come to realize that our very existence is an existence given to us from beyond. 
that our own selfhood cannot be separated from others, and that the self is simply not ego-like in its fundamental structure. The self is always already out there with others in the universe at large. To truly know another is to come into contact with their conscience. And through such deep contact, trust arises from conscientiousness to conscientiousness. Trust arises between conscientious persons. Such mutuality, however, first requires that I be honest with myself. A relationship based on self-interest neither reaches such depths nor has stability and it quickly breaks down. The true basis of conscientiousness, relationships, and self-knowledge is the relationship of self with something that opens up the universe and renders the self capable of being itself. This disclosure of the universe, this on a grand scale, is the awareness that I, other persons, things, and God, or Buddha, are all involved together. It arises at that place which is inclusive of the whole. To know one's mind, then, is to reach that place where such a grand disclosure takes place. In that place, one discovers one's true mind, one's hollow mind, one's no mind, and thus being aware of one's connection with the totality of things. One experiences one's true basis. Conscience drives us to know. I mean, I did not say that. <laughs> Forget that line. <laughs> Conscience drives us to come to know the totality and thereby to come to know ourselves. Just as Socrates was driven by the Delphic command, know thyself, the Buddhist and the Christian too is driven to know the self in a way that allows the no-self to arise. And the no-self is the real, the genuine, and authentic self, where the one is driven to confess, to repent, to strive to reach the limits of reason or to seek enlightenment, one is listening to the biddings coming from the secret room of conscience, aware that something is still left unfinished, and like a craftsman of the spirit, one presses onward until one finally comes to understand by being who it is that one truly is. Such self-knowledge is unavoidably ethical, unavoidably religious and spiritual, and necessarily and unrelentingly conscientious. And what may be even more important, one will have to come to understand that heaven and earth have met in the awesome here and now. That is you, and that is I. By Robert E. Carter, professor of Emeritus, Trent University. Okay, so that is um, the end of what we can possibly see as Nishitani providing a glimmer of what we would think is a sort of Buddhist notion of a communal ontology. Um, and I think it basically, if you really want to understand possibly what... Nishitani is saying and, and how we can sort of grasp what a Buddhist sort of ontology, a Buddhist communal ontology looks like. Um, basically, it's that by having this no self, right, this understanding of a no self, you get rid of the ego. The ego is what doesn't allow a dwelling p place for the other. But by being this no self, you allow for this more communal, conscientious interaction, which is, you know, apparently uh, inherent for all human beings because we always come in 
a kind of relation, right? A relation with my body, relation with my parents, um, relation with things and objects. So there's always a coming into relation that we already are in. Um, so this notion of emptying no-mindedness, this sort of just gets rid of the sort of hindrance of the ego that sort of prevents us from um, seeing the person as they are. Um, I guess if I was to try to really connect the more Christian uh, Trinity communal ontology idea would be like the same thing. Um, would, would just to borrow really from the Bible, where Jesus says, um, "To know the Father, you can only reach the Father through me." Essentially, so th this idea that you can only know the Father through the other, meaning Jesus Christ. Um, I think really, this is probably one of the examples of a communal ontology is the knowing the self through the other. And that's why Buddhism is very emphasized on having this no self, um, which I know it can be hard for the Christian paradigm because they're very much adamant about this idea of persons. But I think, um, I think quite possibly that this sort of extra distinction between persons and no self is primarily a Christian concern, but I think the Buddhist notion of a person may seem unanswered in the Christian lens. However, I think the whole point is this, that Buddhism probably answers the idea of a person by its very adamant um, emphasis on no self. So basically, Buddhism's notion of a person for the Christian paradigm is relatively silent, meaning that actually there's no need to really come up with a, th uh, with a theology of persons, but rather the fact that you would already be a person by just simply uh, getting rid of this self-centeredness, this sort of egoic mind, right? So by having no mindedness, you become a person, right? Um, in my opinion, this doesn't really conflict with Christian's uh, notion of the Trinity, right? Because you can only know the other through, you know, their distinctions, basically, right? So there's this notion in Christianity where it's, the, you know, the Trinity, you have the Father, the Son, the Spirit. Um, and basically, you can only know the other through that sort of one distinction, meaning that, for example, you can only know the Son, you can only know the Father through the Son, and so on. And you can only know the other through the other, by their distinctions, right? So this is why maybe it's Christian theology is a little bit confusing for some people because these things are not negations. They are simply distinctions, right? Distinctions. Um, and, and that's why when you actually kind of study the Trinity a little bit closer, there is this way in which there's persons, right? You have the three persons, um, but then you have one essence, right? Um, if I were to sort of explain this in a more Buddhist way, we can look at this as the essence is literally the, the notion of um, going beyond uh, self and other, right? It goes beyond self and other. So there is this almost like above duality here, um, if we kind of look at the essence. Um, so, yeah, so that's why um, Nishitani is very adamant about this idea of the, the self of non-selfhood, which if I were to be bold, I would probably call it um, 
kind of in in a way it, it would be a sort of <laughs> it would be a stretch to say it's kind of like the Trinity, but it would be in a very general kind of conception of the Trinity where you can say actually there's persons, and then there's um, that you know there's the essence right all of one essence all three are one. Um, so I think, in my opinion, this three in one um, is literally the embodiment of, I think, what Nishitani would call the, the selfhood of no selfhood, really. The sort of three and one, right? You can say the three persons is the more, um, you can say the three persons is the selfhood that is to be actually achieved. And then the essence is the sort of part of um, non-selfhood. But again, right, the problem is always translating Buddhist concepts into Christian concepts and Christian concepts into Buddhist concepts. This is always going to be a problem, but I'm only just doing my speculative, speculative thinking here. But I think if we just take the very general basis of a communal ontology, meaning that actually you can only ever know the other is by sort of actually eradicating, I don't want to say eradicating, but actually just sort of emptying the, the self, right? You can only ever, and I think if you think about it, there is some, some deep connections here with like uh, the Christian idea of kenosis where Jesus sort of comes in um, empties himself of his divine attributes to become human, right? Why is, why is this necessary in some type of way? Um, we can look at it as actually in order to save the other, save mankind, save humanity, you sort of have to really empty yourself completely in order to understand or know the situation. Now, obviously, kenosis is a very problematic um, Christian debate because it, right, it creates a lot of issues like, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of issues in Christian theology about like kenosis in the sense of like, how do we reconcile this idea of divine nature and human nature? Because that's ultimately um, what Jesus has when we sort of, you know, talk about the 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 accepted notion of Christi of of Jesus as as dual nature. Um, obviously, this is still problematic in Christian theology, but I think the problem of kenosis isn't as big as it was in compared to like the the nineteenth century. Anyways, my my whole point is really just a sort of point to how Nishitani is already alluding to what a communal a Buddhist notion of what a communal ontology would look like. And I think the argument can be said that actually a, a Christian communal ontology would still would still get along with that, right? That the uh, the communal ontology itself, um, this idea of you know, if we just take two basic maxims, that I think even what Nishitani is agreeing with is this, right? The Christian maxim would be that you can only you. To know yourself is to know God. That's the, be the first Christian maxim, really. And then the inverse is also true, right? To know God is to know yourself. Um, and then that other part where with the other, it's and the example of that is when Jesus says, you know, you can, that you only know the Father through me, essentially, right? Um, so again, if we just take those maxims there, that simple maxim, uh, to know yourself is to know God, to know God is to know yourself. I think Nishitani is really already emphasizing that idea. That, but again, it could, you know, the, I think obviously there's a lot of differences between Buddhism, and obviously when we talk about Buddhism, 
we could be talking about Buddhisms, really. That's what we would be actually referring to as Buddhisms, um, because not all schools of Buddhism agree on certain things. But it does seem that Nishitani is borrowing from the schools of Pure Land Buddhism and Zen Buddhism. Um, and um, obviously, when we talk about Christianity, we have to also keep in mind that there's Christianities, right? There's a lot of denominations, and they all disagree on certain aspects of those things. Now, I think the com notion of a communal ontology is something that basically all Christians would accept, but obviously, with when we start going into detail, they might disagree. And the same thing with some Buddhist notions. They might disagree if we go into more details. But I think in just a very general overlook, if Nishitani, the way that Carter presents Nishitani's thought on relationships and authenticity for subjectivity, um, then we can, again, I think we have a really good glimpse of what a Buddhist notion of a communal ontology looks like. And in my opinion, it doesn't really look that different from a, at least a Christian general approach to um, subjectivity. But all right, I will sort of end it there. All right, you guys take care.